Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Haldor Thorgerson, welcome to Baha'i Blogcast. Um, I've asked uh, Haldor to begin with saying a Baha'i prayer in Icelandic, because I don't think that many of our listeners have heard a Baha'i prayer in Icelandic before. Ég ber því vitni og guð minn að þú hefur skapað mig til að þekja þig og tilbeiða þig. Ég staðfest á þessu andartaki vannmátt minn og mátt þinn, fátækt mína og auðlegð þína. Engin er guðnum að þú Hjálpin í nöðum, hinn sjálfum nógi. It's beautiful. It sounds like such an ancient language. Well, it's... <laughs> it's uh, it actually is quite close to the Norse language that was uh, used during the uh, the Viking period. Yeah. Uh, and Iceland was, was uh, so uh, remote that it actually stayed quite close to the original language. But what also preserved the language uh, was that uh, the, they they actually s- started writing their sagas, mm. and those were preserved. So we have actually kept uh, the language uh, quite close to what it was originally. So we can read, with some assistance, minimum assistance, we can read the sagas that were, uh, were written in the 1300s. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. So here's a little background, folks. Uh, I'm in Iceland, which is one of my favorite places in the world. This is actually my fourth trip to Iceland. I came once with my son. We loved it so much, we brought my wife for a vacation. And um, we uh, taught at the Icelandic Baha'i Summer School. And then I made friends with an Icelandic actor, and then he asked me to be on an Icelandic TV show. That was my third time. And now this time is my fourth, and I'm here en route to Greenland, doing a kind of super low budget vlog video travelogue documentary about climate change um and visiting a lot of glaciers with some scientists and getting some science from the arctic and um it was recommended to me that uh, on this mini documentary that i speak to haldor who is also a baha'i who's been working for the united nations for quite some time so got to meet Haldor and interview him today for the documentary, and I was just so struck by his work and life that I invited him to come on the podcast. So thank you for being so Whoa. flexible. I'm happy to be with you. And your wife is at an assembly meeting tonight. Is That's that right? right? That's right. Okay, so she, you, you got to sneak It's off. It's my free evening. Your free evening. <laughs> so for fun, you can sneak off and do a, a podcast. Well, yes. And yes. Um, so... Why don't you start at the very beginning, uh, Haldor? Uh, what was it? What was growing up in Iceland like for you? What's the, give us a nutshell of the first sixteen years before you became a Baha'i? Well, um, I, I I was brought up in a, in a in a fishing town. Iceland is uh, is blessed with uh, basically very rich fishing grounds. So this is basically, as they said, it's a rock in the middle of the ocean surrounded by fish. Uh, it's much more than that, of course, as you've seen. But uh, I basically um, all my role models as I was growing up were fishermen, and uh, and so that's that's um, uh, and it's uh, on the northwest of of Iceland, surrounded by mountains. And uh, one of the things that people know about my the town of my birth was uh, uh, that uh, the mountains around us shelter us. But they also shadow. They create a shadow, so we don't see the sun uh, directly from our town uh, for a month or so. And so it's uh, w- what. Uh, um, so that's where I grew up. Uh, um, and uh, um, but I was also fortunate that um, the Baha'i faith was actually brought to that town. What town was this? It's it's called. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's like adding insult to injury. It's actually ice fjord in ice land. <laughs> Is it Isa fjorder? Isa fjorder. Uh, and I, I've been there. You've been there. Yeah, that's up on the west top. 
that's the tippy top of Iceland and the that's, most desolate corner of Iceland. That's right. It's a beautiful little town. Well, well, well correction. <laughs> it's not desolate. Desolate is, is too negative. It's, it's actually, we're very close to nature. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's not, it's not a ghost town. <laughs> no. It's, not a, uh, it's actually a beautiful little town. Uh, my wife and I were very struck by that. We drove through the whole West Fjord lands up there. That's right. And I mean, life uh, has always been tough uh, in, in an environment like Iceland. And, and so what's so interesting about uh, where, I was grew- where I grew up is, is that uh, surrounded by that are areas where people are no longer living because they actually, it was too harsh. So they stepped back a little bit and they all gathered in this uh, town, which is actually quite sheltered, as I said. Not only the mountains, but it's also a bay that uh, protects uh, um, it from the the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so, but the fishing grounds are close, but still sheltered. So, did you grow up? Did you want to be a fisherman then? Actually, I wanted to be a marine biologist, and uh, so because when you when you grow up uh, so close to the ocean, I mean, where we lived on the other side of the street, there were there were no houses. There was just the sea, the, the sea. And so I was, I was really struck by this, how, how can actually all of this stuff grow in the ocean? So for me, it was really um, a marvel. Uh, I was really excited about it. And then uh, I actually decided to study biology. And so within biology, of course, you need to decide where, where you focus. And I really wanted to become a marine biologist. I really wanted to understand uh, the, how uh, fish actually is, is um, uh, gross and, and all of those things. To be honest, the reason I didn't become a, a marine biologist is that I was too seasick. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually have a recording of this, uh, um, actually, because as a biologist, I was doing um, surveying of, of the size of fish in the fishing grounds, and, and I had to uh, kind of do measurements, and I just I was just too seasick for this. So I decided that I could not uh, um, manage this. So I became, decided to do the same, but on dry land. Okay, so that's just a biologist. Take out the word marine. Well, that's right. But uh, yes, so I've, I've, I've always been very fascinated by the, the carbon cycle and uh, kind of how, how, how life actually uh, is maintained. And now, forgive me because I haven't taken biology since high school. What's the carbon cycle? Well, carbon... It's uh, it's basically the the, the essence of life. Uh, uh, all s- living stuff uh, is built around uh, carbon uh, mm-hmm. d- in different forms, and the most uh, I mean, the elementary form that we use is 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 carbon dioxide, mm-hmm. and carbon dioxide is uh, right. a gas that people know about now, but uh, much more than they did when I was growing up. And it's actually then captured uh, uh, by plants, mm-hmm. and and they uh, they uh, harness the uh, the energy of the sun to turn that carbon dioxide into sugar and uh, sugar uh, uh, molecules that actually are, are then built up, and you you have biomass. Mm-hmm. So biomass is is basically a lot of carbon dioxide that has been. Um, turned into uh, energy-rich uh, molecules um, using the energy of the sun. I wish that you had taught my high school biology class because that was I learned more in three minutes listening to you than I remember. Well, what, what's so interesting also is that uh, nature can also teach us so much about spiritual realities. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, as of when I started understanding this, how plants uh, or the leaves actually capture the energy of the sun is that they always turn towards the sun. Hmm. They're always seeking the sun. And for me, it's, it's very similar to when we go into a prayerful attitude. Hmm. Love me so that I can love thee. Hmm. And, and so that is, uh, I think, uh, 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 one way of also understanding uh, through kind of metaphors and, and through analogs in nature we can understand also spiritual realities that are beyond our comprehension. That's beautiful. Uh, that reminds me of a story, uh, and maybe it was repeated on this Baha'i blogcast, I can't remember, because Tierney Sutton was one of the first people I interviewed like three years ago now. Um, but she told a story about 
travel teaching on an Indian reservation, and there was a Native American uh, kind of very wise teacher with her. And when he was, they went out and taught this elderly woman who wanted to hear more about the Baha'i faith way out on the reservation. And and Tierney tried to kind of explain the Baha'i faith in various ways, and it kind of fell flat. She was explaining where it started and what they believe and blah, blah, blah. And, and the, the Native American teacher said to the woman, basically that when the sun is circling around the planet, um, all the Baha'is turn towards where the sun rises and they say this prayer. And funnily enough, it's the prayer that you just read to begin our podcast. And so wherever the sun is going around the planet, there are Baha'is turning toward the sun Mm -hmm. and saying this prayer towards God. So Mm -hmm. it reminded me of that, of like Baha'is with their noonday prayer, their obligatory prayer, Mm -hmm. turning towards the east Mm -hmm. while the sun is up uh, between noon and sundown, Mm -hmm. saying this prayer. And there's a there's a whole a web of prayer kind of spinning around the globe. And that's in some ways like emulation of plants from a nature show all yes. turning towards the sun for, exactly. for sustenance. Yeah, exactly. One thing, I mean, you asked, you asked about my journey. Uh, uh, one thing that I, I think is uh, um, I'm eternally grateful for as a person, as an individual, is that not only were, was the Baha'i faith brought to this small <laughs> kind of uh, uh, town. Yes, uh, but Baha'i faith uh, was brought to Isifirda. Do you yes. know who brought it there? Or? Well, there was a, yes, uh, there was a, um, a proclamation, basically, uh, as it uh, was called at that, uh, at that time, uh, basically introducing uh, th- this mm-hmm. town to mm-hmm. the faith. Uh, uh, but what was so um, critical for my life journey or our life journey uh, was the fact that this was then followed up by uh, pioneers coming mm. to that town and settling. Mm. And, um, and so that uh, pioneers are individuals that uh, actually help uh, you continue on your spiritual journey. Mm. And uh, when you, because I, was, I was, uh, came into contact with the faith as youth, uh, and then everything is, is possible and you're, you're really open to, um, to uh, um, accepting the faith. But it was so important for us to then have that accompaniment uh, mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. Uh, experienced um, uh, people. And, and th- they were just um, really special people. Uh, Do Don and Mary van Brandt. And where were they from? Well, uh, actually, they came to Iceland from Alaska. Mm-hmm. But they were originally from Kentucky. Oh, and uh, and so um, they were um, already had retired by the time they came there. They lived very humble uh, lives in terms of uh, physical, uh, uh, but they were they were really perfect role models for more models for for our, us as youth. So here you have basically retired people coming to this town, and they were completely surrounded by youth that were uh, going through their journey. And, um, and uh, this was such a, uh, an important uh, kind of, <laughs> maybe we could again connect this to, uh, to plants and life. You plant the seed and it starts, but you really have to kind of have it help it mature. And that's what they did in a beautiful way. Oh, that's great to hear. Yes. So you went to firesides at their house and deepened at their house along with other youth of Isafirda? That's right. Well, it was basically our second home. And uh, yeah. we, through, through example, through their humility, they also taught us what it also meant to actually live the life of a Baha'i. Mm. Uh, and then we were blessed. Yeah, I'd love to learn that. <laughs> Well, we're all learning. I mean, it's it's not you, you never graduate from that yeah. school actually, but uh, we were also blessed by um, the fact that uh, even in that town uh, we had um, hands of the cause of God to actually visiting. You had um, hand of the cause of God visiting yeah, Isafirda, yeah. Iceland. That's right. And uh, who, who Ukutia Kerry was there for oh uh, for a summer school, uh, and uh, Mulslaker came there with his wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if we take Iceland uh, more broadly, uh, uh, very many 
uh, hence of the cars actually blessed Iceland with their visit. Yeah. And so that's uh, Moadir, Feishi, um, William Sears, uh, Ruhia Khanum. Wow. So, uh, and I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting some. And so it's, uh, it's, it's just a, so um, one, <laughs> one of the uh, uh, blessings of Iceland is the fact that we are uh, kind of right in that middle of the ocean, but uh, we're also uh, halfway between North America and Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're right where the North American plate comes together with the European plate, but uh, it's also in terms of air travel. Uh, yes. It's actually for quite some time, Iceland, even though it might s- seem very remote, very accessible uh, for people traveling. And most of the transatlantic flights actually pass over Iceland. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's perhaps one of the reasons why um, uh, Iceland has been... Um, while we feel maybe, uh, w- of course, everyone feels that they live at the center of the world, world of course. But um, yes. So what clicked for you when you were 16, 1972, going to Firesides? What, what was their last name, the, the family? Van Brandt. Um, yeah. Van Brandt? Yes. Don uh, and Mary Van Brandt. Um, what clicked for you when you uh, were studying the faith? Well, uh, I mean... At that time, uh, I was very much searching for uh, an understanding of world affairs at that time. Mm. I, was, I was really starting to, under, to uh, 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 wonder about issues around uh, peace, uh, issues around uh, justice. And uh, I was brought up, and I, I got good religious upbringing in terms of, of uh, the essence of Christian faith. Uh, but I uh, and I loved what I got there, but it wasn't. It was not sufficient for me. So I was really searching for answers to more about. Uh, so I, I was attracted. What clicked in my mind was much more issues around global issues, actually, rather than uh, things around uh, spiritual aspects. And and I uh, this might sound like a, uh, like a kind of a strange thing to say, but I, I really felt that if I had an opportunity to, uh, to ask Christ what I should do, he would tell me, follow Baha'u'llah. Oh, wow. And, and yeah. maybe you just, I, I shouldn't be saying this maybe in a, no. in a podcast, but that was... This is a podcast you, mostly by and for Baha'is. I mean, yeah. I think we get maybe a 20% uh, listenership of people that aren't Baha'is, but are you know, interested in Baha'i ideas and stuff. I think yeah. that's beautiful. So well, there was there was a also an element of a spiritual, personal spiritual transformation in, in that. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's so, so important to have these kind of um, sense of uh, that you, that you're actually, uh, you're continuing on a journey. You're not, you're not somehow breaking with the past. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so because of um, kind of um, how uh, limited we are as individuals to actually understanding things. Sometimes we have to simplify, <laughs> especially when you're young. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this was kind of the way for me to kind of uh, uh, deal with this. And uh, but it was. Uh, I mean, I, I I feel quite fortunate to have uh, had the exposure at that uh, formative age. So how did that? How did becoming a Baha'i change the trajectory of your studies and move you eventually to working? for the United Nations on uh, climate change issues? Interesting question. Uh, my sense uh, is that uh, what initially uh, the blessings of the faith were most important in terms of actually uh, things that uh, relate to being young in Iceland. And uh, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of exposure to, to alcohol and, and uh, uh, moral values. Uh, w- are, some of them are, are, are uh, questionable. And so I think initially uh, it was actually helping me get through kind of some of the challenges of, of young age. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, but what I uh, uh, found, uh, I mean, it's difficult for me to trace this back perhaps, but uh, it was very helpful to very early on uh, have this kind of understanding of uh, how 
uh, global governance uh, develops and the context around this. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, but I was never, uh, in my mind, I was never aiming for uh, becoming an international civil servant. That was not something that was up in my mind. It was more through uh, my studies uh, that I started to kind of get quite interested in these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, life is never planned in a sense. And uh, so um, the, my trajectory uh, into becoming an international civil servant was, I think, uh, very much a coincidence. Um, uh, and I actually do distinctly remember the turning point in a way in my in my trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, I had That's studied it. biology, uh, and then I had continued on for advanced studies uh, in the in the in the states. And there I was studying uh, cycling of carbon through ecosystems. So then when I returned back to Iceland, I was fortunate to get a job rather quickly doing research in, in Iceland. So I started the research program around carbon in ecosystems. And so this was an agricultural research institute, uh, and, uh, which fell under the Ministry of Agriculture. And I, I, I still remember this moment in the corridor, uh, the head of the institute, he asked me, Haldor, uh, is it okay I nominate you for that Kyoto stuff? And so, uh, uh, that Kyoto committee. And I said, why don't you? Okay. <laughs> no problem. So what this was, was basically uh, the negotiations of the first protocol under the Convention on Climate Change, which came out of Rio. And the Convention of Climate Change that came out of Rio was, was, was the framework convention. Mm -hmm but it really didn't have teeth in terms of actual commitments. And there was necessary uh, to negotiate this. And so the negotiations of the Kyoto Protocol were ongoing. And so um, what I basically found myself uh, out of coincidence, basically um, in uh, the negotiating team for Iceland mm -hmm. on, uh, on uh, climate change. And uh, being... Uh, the ecologist I am, uh, I, they were really bringing me in mainly on this question. Can you actually use the sequestration of carbon in ecosystems as part of the response to climate change? Right. So, and to get more specific about that, can you pull carbon from the atmosphere and put it back into the earth somehow? You've, you're burning carbon from fossil fuels and coal um, is this is this what you're talking about? Is that is that a viable kind of scientific solution to some of the carbon transfer? Is that That's what you're right. The, basically, what uh, the question on the table was uh, how to actually use the fact that you can actually store carbon in the ecosystem and uh -huh. uh, both above ground and below ground. Mm -hmm. And if we think of it in terms of forest, you can think of it in terms of the timber that uh, is accumulated in forests mm -hmm. and timber is carbon storage basically okay uh, but the 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 fact of the matter is that a lot of the carbon is also stored below ground in soil mm. and what makes soil soil is carbon so the if you wanted if you had sand in one hand and soil in the other the difference is carbon oh wow uh, uh, because um, again sand you, would, you would make the best high school science teacher I mean, I'm so glad you, you went on to some pretty large things, but that's su such a simple way of thinking, at it, well, thinking about it. Yes, well, you have to make things as simple as possible, comma, not simpler. Uh, <laughs> so that's the key, is, is to simplify, but still maintain the essential characteristics. And, and, but the, the, the interesting thing is, and uh, again, this is one of the blessings of, of Iceland, is that our soil is volcanic soil. So it's very reactive in terms of uh, immobilizing carbon. Uh, and so you can actually, by building up through planting trees or planting other types of plants, uh, revegetation, we call this. Uh, you have reforestation if you're planting mm -hmm. trees, but revegetation if you're planting other types of plants. Mm -hmm. And so there's no question, and all of those things accumulate carbon in ecosystems. 
So the question before governments uh, around the Kyoto time, and, and the Kyoto Protocol was, was, was finalized in, in 97. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I found myself in that effort. And, um, and they were really struggling uh, with this uh, at the time, uh, the negotiations. Because it's more complicated mm. than other aspects of, of the problem. Sure. Uh, and so the, the initial intention was to focus the, the Kyoto Protocol only on industrial emissions and not uh, try to Im Im bring in the complexity of the fact that you can actually also use nature to, um, uh, to store carbon. So uh, to make a long story short, that's basically kind of my scientific insights and my experience uh, was actually brought into the negotiations, mm -hmm. uh, both first in the Icelandic team, but then uh, uh, it, we found ourselves actually a little bit in a, uh, one of the characteristics of the negotiations is that you really, you have to inject ideas. And Iceland uh, actually is a very good vehicle for injecting ideas into that discourse in the negotiations, mm, okay. because we're not a big block. We're not. We're not a big player, mm -hmm. uh, and so we can be more agile. We can be much more responsive, and so actually, at the end of the day, uh, Iceland, uh, Iceland's ideas around how to do this influenced the, the provisions on land use in the Kyoto Protocol to a large extent. Oh wow, that's that's great. Well, it's basically just uh, a fact, and uh, and so um, this was a kind of an interesting to be basically thrown into uh, uh, that process at, at that early stage. So, so you really went from a biology and carbon researcher on an island in the North Atlantic to all of a sudden kind of having conversations on the world stage with uh, some very big kind of treaties and discussions that were going on. Well, uh, uh, you you make this sound very uh, glamorous, actually, but uh, <laughs> there, there there is. I'm sure it was a lot of nerdy stuff, a lot of powerpoints, and a yes, lot of like exactly. endless colloquiums. Is that, and, well, it's a yeah. It's actually uh, it's it's in a sense this notion of negotiations is is a bit misleading actually because it you get the impression that this is kind of um, uh, a zero-sum game where I get something and then you don't get it. Right. Uh, it's actually not so much that... That's a traditional negotiation. That, yes, yeah. but actually in climate uh, change, it's almost like a collective design of an approach that works f for everyone, right. but also has an uh, impact on the problem. And so uh, it was um, uh, fascinating, actually, to kind of go through that stage first in the, uh, the Kyoto stage. But then I was drawn into, I was asked to actually work for the government after that. Uh, and so I actually became a, a full-time negotiator for Iceland. Oh, uh, wow. And, uh, and then uh, was elected uh, to chair we, the, the uh, uh, this maybe is, too uh, detailed for you to actually go into, but the way the negotiations work is that this actually is in two chambers, mm -hmm. one on, on science and technology and another one on implementation. And I was for two years the chair of the, of the chamber on, on, uh, on science and technology. Mm. And that was a really exciting thing to do, actually, because then you actually you lift yourself out of uh, representing one party, in this case Iceland, mm -hmm. and you start actually then trying as a chair to bring everyone together uh, around a common outcome. So how did you use Baha'i principles um, in these kind of high stakes discussions, negotiations, agreements, conversations uh, with science as a centerpiece? Perhaps the most kind of obvious one is uh, the understanding of consultation, ah. the process of consultation, yeah. uh, and uh, the guidance that we have been given uh, around that process. Mm -hmm. It was really helpful for me in terms of uh, helping uh, uh, come, I mean, the stages you go through in a consultative process in the Baha'i Assembly mm. in many ways are similar to what you, even though you're doing it as a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. But there's another um, very important aspect of, of this effort uh, as, as being a chair is, is, is humility. 
uh, and so uh, because uh, you almost as a chair you you need to bring the best out of the room without getting in the way oh, uh, of the outcome yeah and uh, that's a biggest challenge for people quite often so when bringing humility to a to a position of leadership is what you're talking that's right. about that's, that's right. uh <laughs> it's pretty impressive. We don't see a whole lot of that in today's world. Um, you don't see it. You're right. But uh, I must say, and uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a, um, an interesting uh, reality, basically, is that through this journey, I have come across uh, beautiful people from all corners of the globe. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and so there is uh, a spirit of service actually penetrates a lot of what happens all the way from the scientists assessing what the science is really telling us mm -hmm. to the people that are representing their countries and trying to kind of come to a common understanding. Mm -hmm. So um, you you really see the humanity at its best quite often in these things. Mm. Oh, that's great. But also at its worst. Uh, the, I mean, there are there's the whole spectrum. Hmm. But it's it's actually, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, it's a very um, interesting um, kind of almost like a creative process. Oh, that's that's great. So, flash forward even further, you're doing additional work uh, on Paris on the Paris Climate Agreements, which yes. is uh, what was that. Four, four years ago, six years ago, when when did that? Yeah, 2015 was it was when it uh -huh. was concluded. And so by that time, I had actually become uh, an international civil servant uh, in the sense that I was working for the secretariat to the the, the climate convention. Okay, and it's uh, it's part of the UN system, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's it's located in in Bonn, Germany, on the on the banks of the Rhine, and so uh, um, there I. Uh, during this journey from uh, Durban to Paris, it was a four-year journey of the countries coming together around Eight. what type of agreement could be reached in Paris. I was basically uh, that, leading a team uh, that was supporting the negotiations, supporting the chairs mm -hmm. of these negotiations, and then also the countries that uh, annually became presidents of the conference of the parties. Every year, all of the parties to the convention come together uh, in what's called the Conference of the Parties, a but cop. it's all, always yeah. referred to as COPs. Yeah. And they, they have numbers, uh, so uh, annual COPs. And, uh, but most of the time, they're they associated with uh, the cities. So I referred earlier to Kyoto. That was the third conference of the parties in Kyoto. In Paris, it was the 21st conference of the parties. Oh, okay. So... Um, Basically, uh, at, then uh, everyone comes together. But what I, I think is so important is to um, kind of remind or kind of recall the, the uh, kind of the, um, uh, the fact that um, what drives all of this is the uh, sense of urgency around the problem itself. Mm -hmm. But also the opportunities around uh, uh, the transition that we need to make, the transformation we need to make. So it, while it's a formal process, it's very much connected to the real world. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's not all pie in the sky. It's, it's like we need to figure this out, so we need to put it into action to save the planet. Exactly. And also uh, very important moments where uh, basically climate change has sent signals to the negotiators. At one point when we gathered for these annual meetings, yeah. um, uh, uh, just after um, uh, Typhoon Hai Haiyan had, had hit the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the, Fi the Philippine delegation brought the urgency of the situation ah. right into the rooms. Right. And so there's quite a bit of drama in this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, what's also very in interesting is that because this is all under the, uh, the UN fabric, uh, all countries are equal in the sense that they all have a voice and all decisions are made by consensus there's never voting on substance when we were talking earlier today i was thinking because there's kind of a 
a big anti-UN kind of bias in the United States right now. Um, it's kind of reactive, and there's certainly a lot of dysfunction in the United Nations, bureaucracy, bloat, corruption. Um, but people don't remember what it was like before there was a United Nations. I mean, you couldn't hardly get three or four countries together to agree on where to meet or when to meet or how mm -hmm. to meet or mm -hmm. who was going to chair or how the rules of order were going to work and mm -hmm. let alone 200 countries together. And mm -hmm. the United Nations has had so many successes uh, around the planet from global health and education to uh, the strategic development goals. Um, there is, it's deeply flawed because it's still kind of, uh, you know, supported by a, such a materialistic a nationalistic world system, but uh, such incredible things are done uh, by the UN. Have you, in, in what ways does the UN kind of mirror uh, the revelation of Baha'u'llah? Uh, we're seeing global governance coalescing, growing through uh, incremental steps. And, uh, and it's really important to also think through how the challenges have actually shaped what is put in place. And, uh, and we, um, there, there is a beautiful uh, uh, analysis of this uh, if from the Universal House in their, um, in their letter earlier this year. And, uh, and there, uh, the successive steps. But what I think, think is so interesting now is to look at the transition that we are observing now, because the, the original United Nations were actually in 1945, focusing extremely f importantly on peace and security, on and then uh, human rights and then development. And uh, a lot of the structures were put up around that. And it was the charter is very much based on national sovereignty as the fundamental building block. What we have now with this, the, the challenges that we're dealing with now, such as climate change, um, uh, we need to go beyond relying entirely on that foundation. Uh, because we are basically talking about uh, a huge alignment in terms of interests of countries, but they're all connected to a global problem. Uh, and so you can actually come to uh, um, a limit to how much you can actually build this uh, global governance uh, within the constraints of national sovereignty. And I would submit that the Paris Agreement went, it's like the, the high watermark mm. of what can be agreed through consensus within the constraints of focusing on it through national sovereignty. B but the energy of the agreement is not uh, coming from that. The energy of the agreement actually comes from uh, its, uh, uh, the fact that it's actually based on determination of a very profound moral necessity. And that is to stop uh, the, the, the climate disruption where all countries can have a future. And this uh, basically is a global risk management uh, undertaking. And so you're basically uh, then uh, inviting countries, and that's what the agreement does, is to uh, invite countries to make a contribution to that objective. Mm. And so you can really think of these as obligations that go beyond their national interests. But I don't think we will be able to change the legal structures. So the strengths of these agreements does not come so much from their legal characteristics. Uh -huh. It comes from uh, how they are connected to science, how they are connected to civil society, how they are connected to the, the aspirations of, of countries, and also this uh, acceptance that um, there has to be a global stock taking of, of progress. And that's what is, uh, I think, a, a fairly uh, novel um, characteristics of the of the Paris Agreement is that it actually uh, is based on necessity to limit uh, warming or heating to uh, uh, one uh, on the range between 1.5 and as close to 1.5 as possible, but well below two degrees, 
uh, beyond industrial level or uh, temperatures. Uh, but that is basically a, a risk management determination without necessarily knowing how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's like you know that y you know what's necessary, but then once you've determined that, and you had discussed that as being moral before. Yes, because the, uh, this was very clear uh, in this conversation where you basically, uh, some of the levels of risk can be dealt with by some countries, but not all countries. And so the countries that are on the front line of climate change, like small island states right. or low-lying or, or, or some of the uh, least developed countries in Africa, yeah. they are... And it's, in a sense, a little bit of an unjust problem in that sense, that uh, the ones that have benefited least mm -hmm. from, uh, uh, from industrial development are actually first seeing, they're taking the brunt of the problem. Right. So that's, that's environmental justice. In a sense. Uh, or injustice. Injustice, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's also, but what, what, I, what I mean by a moral determination is that it was uh, very much influenced by voices of moral leadership that came forward in the lead up to Paris. And I'm here referring not only, I mean, the most well known and the most comprehensive was the Laudato Si that came from the Pope mm -hmm. uh, in, in the spring of 2015. Mm -hmm. But it was also... Uh, and can you explain what that is super the, quick? The, the Laudato Si is, uh, is actually um, reflections by the Pope uh, around okay. social development and justice and climate. It's not just about climate. Mm -hmm. uh, it also goes into poverty and social uh, development. And once it's Very issued, they actually become part of the doctrine in a sense. Of oh, that. wow. So it was a... Um, it was a very important from the from the Pope. But going going back to this moral imperative, you're not talking about like right and wrong morality. That's right. It's much more about what matters, mm -hmm. and the fact that um, the it's basically in an essence an acceptance of unity of mankind, mm. uh, because uh, you are actually saying, and that's influencing the decisions, that it's not acceptable. Uh, to the global community uh, that s small island states, for example, that are threatened by climate change, uh, basically are just wiped off the map. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that w we can necessarily secure uh, continued uh, settlement on all atoll nations. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want sure. to go into the specifics here, but... Uh, We're going to lose some islands. By and large. Like it or not. Well, there are issues there, but it's, um, it's a risk assessment but it's, uh, it's actually deciding that you are going to stop it without necessarily looking at the question of feasibility. Mm -hmm. Because if you first decide what's necessary, it does change the calculus on what is feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if we had asked the experts, is this feasible? They would have to be honest and say, no, I'm afraid not. Yeah. Because they would have looked in the rear view mirror because what we are now embarked on as a global community is actually a purposeful uh, transformation of the global economy, which has never been done before. Wow. Because that's the only way through this. Uh, that it has to be purposeful in the sense that it, it's a race against time. And so uh, we are basically doing, uh, it's, it, there's a reference to this as being a change of systems systemic change. It's not fine-tuning of existing systems. Uh, what we had to do with the, with the ocean layer when we discovered the hole in the ocean layer because of coolants uh, that actually um, penetrated up to the stratosphere and, and led to depletion of ocean, ocean um, it was a technical fix in mm -hmm. a sense. Let's be honest. We we kept our free refrigerators. They just had a different coolant in them. Right, and aeros we banned aerosol cans. Exactly, and uh, and so uh, it was one of the most successful, if but not. But that was the a worldwide effort. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. and it, it was a beautiful effort, and it was uh, it was a really uh, uh, important success. Mm -hmm. But the limitation. I mean, and I'm not saying it wasn't difficult, mm -hmm. but the it's an it was an order of magnitude simpler than what we are doing now with climate because we're basically changing the energy system. Yeah. We're changing the transport system. Yeah. We are changing the food system. Yeah, agriculture. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and the whole 
whole food system, not just agriculture, but also the the processing and distribution and consumption of food. Sure. Uh, and uh, and so the, I had some delicious avocado here in Iceland, and it made me think about yes. <laughs> the ship that those avocados <laughs> rode on, or the airplane, or wherever exactly. they came from. Mexico exactly. or California. About thirty percent of global emissions actually come from food, one or one way or another. Mm. So the food system is clearly a part of this. So what? But my main point here is that it's the scale of the uh, of the transformation that we need to face, uh, and and it's much better to rea- to determine right at the outset that this is a fundamental transformation. Because if you start the journey and saying, well, it's just we're going to tweak this, That's we're going right. to tweak that, and yes. make past this little law and ban yeah. this one little That's thing. Right. Then you lose time. And, uh, and, but the other beauty of this is that uh, the transformation that we need to do is actually uh, has huge benefits. So it's not that we are, uh, uh, w- w- as we uh, manage climate change, we are creating a better future. More livable cities, air we can... Breathe. Mm-hmm. Uh, the list goes on. We're not buying so much crap. Exactly. We're not uh, throwing out so much of our food. Exactly. I just heard today that the average family throws out almost a third of its food. Exactly. It's wasted. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's right. And 30% of the food produced... Buying so many clothes. The manufacture of clothing is very uh, toxic. And at, Exactly. And, and we are also flying genes across the globe uh, <clears throat> in, in using courier services. Right, and so <clears throat> there is uh, so much of this is about uh, more sustainable consumption, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's um, uh, and as we know, uh, there is really uh, no relationship between consumption and happiness. Right, and that was the bill of goods that we've been <laughs> sold, kind of for the last hundred years exactly. or, or more, and more and newer. And, and also this competing with uh, having what others have. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, this, will, this can actually change rather fast. And, and, and one of the things that I think is so important when we talk about all of this, don't sell human beings uh, short. We are... Our ingenuity. Yes. And our... And determination. Exactly. If we put our mind to things... It's amazing what we can achieve, and and I, I think it's uh, it's important also to to amplify the successes and talk about the successes. And one of the key uh, solutions to climate change is to use renewable sources of energy, uh-huh. uh, solar or wind, and that's happening very fast. But it's important to understand that the s- experts were never able to predict the speed. They always underestimated the speed. Ah, because they said, well, here's how quickly it grew in the past. It must grow on a somewhat similar similar formula into the future. That's right. They were always looking at the rearview mirror. mirror and this, They always looked at that, what had happened right. in the past. And so um, the transformative power uh, of uh, kind of disruptive uh, innovations, and disruptive innovations are not just about hardware not just about technologies it's also about business models it's also about consumer preferences mm-hmm. and uh, in uh, in terms of where i got my energy from when i was working on the paris agreement uh, i mentioned the, the the moral leadership but also i really think it's important to understand the business leadership as well mm-hmm. and uh, understandably the 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 business that was uh, really uh, kind of ahead of others where corporations are that close to consumers because they do know, they realize that they need to be ready for the consumer of tomorrow. Mm. And so uh, the consumer goods companies, uh, they uh, are really have, have, have really understood this, uh, that they really have to change uh, and, and they actually uh, wanted this change. Mm-hmm. But there's also uh, a need of a systemic change of the economy in terms of incentives. And uh, one of the uh, realities here is that um, uh, the market forces Mm -hmm. don't really work when it comes to climate change because of a huge what's called market failure. Market Mm -hmm. failure is when some of the information for the market is missing. Mm -hmm. And, And what I'm referring to here is the cost 
of emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Because you can emit now, most corporations and, and individuals and cities can emit carbon dioxide and now the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at no cost. Right. But this, there's only one atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the, the damage and the detrimental effect and the cost of that is yeah. then borne by everybody. Right. But it's also borne by those same corporations. Yes. So, you know, you have, you're going to see more and more uh, corporations greatly hurt um, by climate change. Think about the insurance companies, these giant, you know, multi-billion dollar insurance companies mm -hmm. every year paying out more and more and more. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure there's many other industries Yes. that are directly impacted by this kind of seemingly free ability to pollute exactly. with CO2. Exactly. In the technical terms, people refer to this as, uh, in economics as internalization of, of externalities. And you have, to, you have to see on your books the cost of emitting carbon dioxide. As soon as you do that, you can actually mobilize the investment then into new technologies and, and to change the production. But one thing that is absolutely clear is that coal as an energy source is not part of the future. Yeah, no, got to get rid of that. Well, it's, it's not sustainable. And, uh, and the costs uh, by far outweigh the benefits. And what about oil and gas? Can we throw that in there as well? Or well, that can be phased out? It, it, there's a different timing of the phasing out of, of other uh, fossil fuels. But uh, yeah. it's really, uh, we, we just have to face that reality. And that's what uh, uh, people are doing now and, and, and realizing much more clearly that uh, uh, there are ways of, of capturing the carbon dioxide that comes out of coal and storing it immediately. But it's just far more expensive than actually doing uh, things with solar and, uh, and, uh, and wind. And at the moment, uh, it's actually more expensive to build a new coal-powered power plant than to uh, build uh, solar or wind in many economies. Yeah. And soon it will actually be more expensive to actually run an existing coal-fired power plant. So there, the coal is on its way out. So. One of the things when we were talking earlier about my little climate change uh, documentary, uh, you mentioned that if there's a silver lining in all of this, it is that, and you've, and you've referenced this a few times uh, as you've been speaking, that humanity is at a new level uh, as witnessed by this Paris Agreement where it's all the countries coming together as equal players and... Um, I know I'm not going to get the lingo right because uh, there's a lot of UN lingo. Uh, I know I, I said to a scientist earlier the Paris Accords. It's like it's not an accord. It's not an accord. And it's a, it's an agreement. It's very different. So there's a lot of like lingo little traps in here. But that there was this ultimate act of countries coming together, looking at what's best for humanity. And this is the first time that and you had referenced this before, the countries of the world coming together to say, what's best for the globe? How can we set aside some of our national interest to do what's right, that moral imperative, to do what matters? And in, in, in a lot of ways of thinking, that's, very, that's a very Baha'i kind of step. So if there's, if there's a silver lining in the upcoming chaos and catastrophe that will be emerging from climate change, because there's going to be some, it is that humanity must come together to fix this problem. So I'm wondering if you can address that a little bit more from a Baha'i perspective uh, and how we can look at this uh, imperative spiritually. Exactly. There is uh, there, uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, this problem, climate change, uh, is actually helpful in actually uh, accelerating the coming together of of, uh, of of the unifying unifying it's a unifying force uh, because of it's a threat that is entirely global mm -hmm. but it's also uh, testing other things it's not just testing how countries come together it's also uh, uh, helping communities come together and it's it's really important to think also about the, those that are affected uh, by the early impact. And by the by the way, we are already seeing 
enormous suffering because of climate change. Yes. And displacement, forced displacement, uh, it's already contributed to, uh, to migration crisis and refugees. I mean, you can connect that very specifically to the, uh, the civil war in Syria, right? That's right. And, it's, uh, which it's, kind of was the big spawning of a, a large part of the refugee crisis. There's that's other right. it's African a, refugees, but... And that was from a, from, a, from a drought, right? That's right. It's a threat multiplier that kind of pushes a system over the edge. But what I really think is so important, uh, you asked about uh, kind of how this, what this means from a Baha'i's per- perspective, is that the Paris Agreement is really the end of the beginning of a long journey. And so the, the unifying forces are, and, and constructive forces in society are going to be even more needed mm-hmm. on the way forward than now. And also, as the impacts of climate change become m- more severe, uh, the cohesion that is brought together, b- brought by the, the, uh, the, the spiritual development through the Baha'i faith, are going to be really uh, critical. And, and it's really, we've seen this actually being demonstrated already when Vanuatu was, mm, was mm-hmm, hit by mm-hmm. a typhoon. And, uh, and the way the, the communities uh, rebounded uh, were, uh, uh, so the, the institution of the Master Glaskar is already, even though it was already there. So what I'm basically saying that social cohesion uh, that keeps communities together is one of the really essential uh, components of what is called resilience in climate jargon. Mm -hmm. Resilience is basically how quickly you rebound after uh, being hit by Mm -hmm. an event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you basically, your your ability to withstand disasters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the suffering around climate change uh, in the coming years is not necessarily something that would have to happen it's more because uh, and the most of the greatest suffering is going to be where corruption is rape uh, there's a lot of co- corruption uh, where uh, the the systems are weak and where social cohesion is weak and that's a i think a, a, a spiritual development question uh, uh, and so uh, my sense is that when baha'i communities think of what climate change means for their immediate environment, I think they should really connect it to the, uh, what they're doing through the core activities, what they're doing through building up the Baha'i administration, what they're doing through building up the institutions of the faith. So there, it's not just something abstract happening at the international level, it's something very tangible also at the local level. That is really uh, fantastic. I had never thought of that before. So here I am doing this little documentary on climate change and I'm learning a ton. But the idea that the the core activities, the institute process, the community development, the grassroots development that Baha'is are striving to undertake, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, is not just like, oh, this is a good idea. Um, theoretically, it would be nice if we had a lot of children's classes and devotionals and people doing home visits and connecting with one another because that's a, a nice and sweet thing. But we're in at the beginning of a global crisis on the magnitude that humanity has never seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, dear listeners, you might kind of be rolling your eyes right now and going, wait, what? Huh? Really? Really? Is it that bad? But I will tell you, this is a sidebar, and then I'll get back to answering you talking about what you just said. Sidebar, what I've learned in doing this little video, it's a super low-budget thing. Don't expect some giant Al Gore documentary. Um, But stuff's going to get really, really bad. There are some very, very dark uh, aspects to where we are most certainly headed. Um, There's... Too much to go into right now. That would be its own podcast. There's a lot of information about this out there. But between ocean acidification, um, sea level rise, um, uh, violent storms, droughts, wildfires, all of these climate changes that will be taking place are going to greatly uh, impact and damage human society. And like you said, especially some of the areas in the world that 
didn't produce all of this carbon and will be hurt by it the most. But going back to what you said, and I'll let you jump in here, you're the expert, but um, going back to what you said, that, that the community development process in the Baha'i world is a vital and necessary tool for what's coming ahead. That's right. The, the problem is looked at in two ways. One is to, to slow down climate change, and that's reducing the amount of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. But the other aspect is to preparing for the impacts. And so that's, uh, both of these are very much uh, connected to uh, spiritual development. And I actually think we're in civilization building as well. And uh, we're working towards an ever advancing civilization. And so let's, uh, let's be quite uh, bold in thinking about uh, how this is all connected. So how bold can you be? Like, bring us up to how bold is that? Well, one, We're creating a new civilization, yeah. one based on spiritual principles in, in order to survive this and in order to work together and to adapt. Yeah. Is well, that... we, we have to realize that materialism is bankrupt. Okay. So uh, this is really, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of the road on, on, on basically basing everything on consuming more and uh, and seeking happiness through that so it's but there's another really profound aspect of all of this is understanding human nature and uh, and that's where we can as through the through the guidance of the faith we can really help our fellow citizens actually come to a, a, a deeper understanding of human nature uh, we can also help uh, particularly the youth, but also other people that we come in contact with uh, to make sense of what is happening in the big, in the world. And, uh, and in a sense, I, I, I quite often uh, think back to the peace message of 85, uh, because we basically, as mankind, we basically have two, uh, we have two roads now ahead of us. There's, we have two options. Okay. One is to uh, basically uh, deliberately, as, as we have been talking about, actually uh, applying all of the solutions that are available. There's, there's the readily available solutions for 70% of the, of the emissions. Uh, if we do the, uh, the uh, and, and we really uh, align all the forces and, and we deliberately move out of the difficulties that we are, we can actually come out of this with a manageable amount of, of suffering. The other option is to basically hit the wall. It's very similar to the, what the Universal House kind of outlined uh, in terms in the peace message, uh, in terms of a path. And, and uh, w what, w what we have to do and work with other constructive forces around us mm -hmm. is to make sure that, that we exit this problem in a deliberate, constructive way, uh, with a strong unity of purpose, but also a strong belief in kind of the ability of, of, of communities and civilizations to actually improve. But when I, the one sentence that stuck out the most to me from the last letter from the Universal House of Justice was, so be it. Uh, and I know that was almost a response to the, to the peace letter uh, back in the 80s, but... Um, I'm not sure that we're going to get there. I'm not sure that we're going to hit those 70% marks. Well, the, well, one thing that... Uh, Maybe I, this is my natural skepticism coming through. When, when you have these kind of... You, 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 you paint these, these options, we're talking about kind of the extremes of, of a continuum. And let's realize that for some of us, we've already hit the wall. Uh, there are uh, there is enormous suffering already connected to climate change, unfortunately, and so uh, and and things are going to get worse. What I'm more thinking about uh, here is is that uh, um, you you can actually uh, if we don't act and and there is now a window. Uh, of actually changing the course uh, for for for, uh, the for the global community, uh, if we don't uh, make success uh, faster now in the in in the next decade, uh, 
uh, we are actually getting into a, a very rough territory on a lot of fronts. So wh what next? What next for the Baha'is? What next for humanity? Where do we go? 2020 is a big year. That's right. And, and 2020 is basically kind of the starting gun for, for the Paris Agreement. And I, I don't want to leave uh, um, the listeners with the impression that, I've, that I'm selling the Paris Agreement as kind of the panacea. Yeah. It's actually a very important framework for the solution. It's not the solution itself. Okay. The solution itself will actually come from the fundamental transformation that needs to happen uh, in, uh, in, in the economy. Uh, and, and, uh, now, I would, I would say that sounds like it, the transformation needs to be a kind of a radical spiritual transformation. That's right. And it's very much about well, our relationship with nature. It's, our, uh, it's also in terms of uh, uh, how we value uh, nature, how we value th uh, uh, things in our life. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's um, uh, in terms of our lifestyles uh, will be changing for the better, by the way, but they need to change. And, uh, and so there, th that's why uh, I really think that uh, this was, in a sense, Paris was the end of the beginning we are now actually dealing with the issue itself. So what do we do? Um, we, we, we take responsibility. And the key point for everyone is to be responsible, to understand their own carbon footprint, yep. uh, to understand what they can do to reduce that footprint. And, and then the whole uh, challenge is to actually maximize value creation for each ton of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. We will continue to emit, uh, but we, we have to uh, decarbonize the economy and continue creating wealth, but not relying on carbon to do that. We also need to uh, make sure that societies and communities are ready for uh, the impacts that will hit us. And we talk about vulnerability in this context. It's not just vulnerable nations, it's also vulnerable communities within nations and even not, uh, vulnerable neighborhoods within cities. Mm. So it's also very much about caring for uh, other human beings um, and, and focusing on, on that kind of community building and civilization building. But we also need to innovate uh, in our economy. Uh, and that's what I think is, um, is happening very fast, but it, it, it does... Um, it does have to happen faster. It seems like there are so many social justice issues uh, around climate change. It brings up so many different kinds of inequities, financial, economic, racial, uh, the haves, the have-nots, uh, racism. So how do the teachings of Baha'u'llah relate to, to those issues? Very directly. And, and, uh, and let me just take one example of uh, where he talks about the, uh, the we, where, where we have to eliminate the extremes of wealth and poverty. Uh, I just, by the way, sorry to butt in, I just heard today that the top 10% wealthiest people on the planet are responsible for 50% of the carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the extremes of wealth and poverty. The, one of the extremes of wealth is extreme carbon uh, emissions and pollution. That's right. And, and we have to, at the same time, as we, uh, we, we talk about uh, what we need to do, achieve collectively as uh, nations of the world and, and people of the world, is by the middle of this century, we will have to reach a balance between emissions and removals. And what that means is that we need to fit within those constraints. But that has to be a just um, and fair distribution of resources. And yeah. it's really important to at the same time realize that the spirit, it's a spiritual imperative to eliminate hunger, to eliminate poverty, uh, but also the extremes of wealth. And, uh, and so there is, there is a, a, in my sense, a, a, a very strong guidance from, uh, from Baha'u'llah as a divine physician uh, to this, the ailments that we're dealing with. But we need to go to the roots of the problem, not just the symptoms. So it seems like this climate crisis is bringing to the surface, uh, as if they needed to be brought to the surface anymore, the extremes of wealth and poverty 
and uh, and the kind of economic injustice that kind of is all over the planet. That's right. And there's one dimension of this that is uh, just this dimension of this conversation is also the intergenerational equity issues. And uh, because there is a, uh, always it's a human nature that kind of puts things into the future. But it's really important that we do not leave all of those uh, the difficult um, heavy lifting to future generations and uh, and the suffering. So there's also this uh, the importance of actually taking this issue on right now, right now, here and now, in our generation. That's I'm in right. my fifties. You're in your sixties. That's right. We have to do what we can. That's right. And um, that's right. And uh, so you hear that Baha'is? I know a lot of Baha'is out there with very large carbon footprints, <laughs> and uh, myself included, by yeah. the way. And I need to make some very serious changes around that. And, uh, and it's a clarion call for action because the climate crisis is not simply about driving an electric car and recycling your bottles. This is, the ramifications are huge around this. That's right. Part of the, we are going to have mass migrations of people uh, from climate crises. We're going to have climate refugees uh, by the millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions uh, depending on if our governments follow through on the Paris agreements. Mm -hmm. So what's the Baha'i role in that, for instance? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a humanitarian crisis. Humanitarian I mean, it, crisis. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so the, the, I mean, really we have, as, as Baha'is, we have to lead the way because we are privileged in a sense, because we have access to the guidance of Baha'u'llah. And that's not uh, as readily available to others. And so part of uh, the, our service here is to actually bring the message out and to, to bring the guidance from Baha'u'llah uh, to the masses because this is such an important part of, of the way forward. So it's a clarion call toward, towards teaching as well. That's right. and uh, Not just teaching because it's a good idea and Baha'u'llah is so sweet and... Baha'is have fun singing songs together, but because humanity absolutely needs this message. That's right. And also innovation to actually create a new civilization. And uh, that's, not, uh, that's not just copying the past. It's actually uh, moving to a, a, a new future. And that's, that's, that happens at the local level. You cannot, uh, social innovation cannot be centralized. It's actually going to be very organic. And finally, how do we radically spiritually transform our relationship to the planet? Part of it is to accept our place in nature mm -hmm. and respect uh, and, 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 and be grateful for, for nature. And, and also uh, be uh, stewards and of, of nature and, uh, uh, and also work with the natural processes. And uh, this is something that uh, is very important part of, of the solution. Bahola talked about the importance of agriculture, and, and I think this is one of the examples of, of, uh, of how he has basically been kind of helping us think through what now needs to happen, because we need to feed, um, uh, we need to lift everyone out of poverty at the same time as we need to change the, the, the production systems in, in agriculture. So is there a history of the Baha'is or the Baha'i faith and the environment and environmental issues? The most, I think, exciting source for, for that would be to read about the first global conservationist. Um, actually, there are many of those that we know today, but the, really the first one was a Baha'i. Uh, Richard St. Barb Baker, many of you would have heard of him as the man of the trees. Mm. And uh, he was transformed, uh, he became a Baha'i in Africa uh, when he was uh, working there for, for the British. Um, but he uh, actually uh, pioneered restoration of forest ecosystems and he was the first to really uh, come up with the concept of the Great Green Wall that is now being built across Africa. And, that's and there's a recent book about him oh. that uh, I really think would be a good source. It's written by Paul Hain Hainley. 
and um, basically the man of the trees. And um, uh, and it really it kind of tells the story of, of, of his, uh, both uh, kind of how he came to what he did. He is uh, working with The Guardian uh, and uh, and then some of his writing. So it's... Uh, and. But in terms of history, uh, let me just mention a book that really influenced my journey. And that's a, a book by Arthur Lyon Dahl. It's called Unless and Until. And it's basically about how unity of mankind relates to the issues on the environment. Uh, he has continued writing since, and I'm working with him now. Just uh, and that's Arthur Dahl, D-A-H-L, for those interested in looking up. That's right. And There'll be a link below. That's right. And he, um, he has uh, contributed so much to this, and he still is doing so. He's also been an international civil servant. But I just wanted to mention him because of how much he influenced me as, a, as I was starting my journey on this. Oh, that's great. So, Haldor, you've been working behind the scenes in bringing nations together for these consultations on these epic questions. What about you personally as a Baha'i right now? What are you, what are you thinking about as a soul on your journey? Um, what, what do you struggle with? What's next for you on your personal spiritual path and your, the tasks that's in, that are in front of you right now? Well, uh, we have relocated back to Iceland. And, uh, and I it, noticed. And, this, <laughs> and it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful um, opportunity to actually apply uh, at the, at, in real world, at the local level, the things that we've been talking about. But uh, I'm, I'm also um, uh, quite uh, kind of blessed by the fact that, that Iceland um, is, is quite accepting of the Baha'i faith. And, and, uh, and so there are opportunities in Iceland to, uh, to actually bring the, the um, insights from the faith to the highest level and, and spiritual leadership in this country. And so that is something that I think is so uh, uh, an important challenge to all of us is to actually uh, engage with the constructive forces in society uh, and uh, guided by what we know from the faith and, and how the faith has transformed us spiritually, but use that to actually engage with uh, constructive forces. And, and uh, we're also working here with uh, the Arctic region. And so there is an opportunity here to actually uh, look, work with faith-based organizations on these big challenges. Uh, and so the day is just not long enough to actually utilize so many of the opportunities that we have here. But it's also, um, uh, I'm, I'm blessed with five grandchildren. Uh, and uh, and that is that is that is such a uh, such a blessing. So I mean that that um, uh, is part of my purpose in life as well. I'm sorry, you won't have any time to play with your grandchildren because there's too many of the world's problems you need to fix. So sorry. Perhaps they are also a key to the solution. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> you can all work together. How's that? That's right. Haldor, it has been such an honor talking to you. I'm so glad I got to meet you and so thrilled that uh, the Baha'i world and the regular world gets to hear your, your wisdom and, and perspective. Thank you for all the work you've done on behalf of really humanity. And, uh, and it's really, to me, I feel like a, a shining example of using the Baha'i teachings and, and, and belief systems in such a, in a practical applicable way working like you say with the forces the constructive forces out there to to be the leaven to help move things forward i know i mixed a lot of metaphors there but it was just a delight thank you so much thank you but i it's such an honor to be an international civil servant and so i just wanted to underline that uh, i don't take credit for the things that have happened i was blessed to be um, at the right time to, to do the things I could do. Uh, but I also learned so much myself. Can you give me some lessons in humility, by the way? I need, I need some work on that. Maybe we'll, we'll get off the microphone. We, you, can, you can help me out. You can be like my humility tutor. Consider it done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. 
Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night. <laughs>